And let's see, she's all ready to go. You're, you're on there, Linda. Awesome. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, thank you so much, Fred, for that amazing song and prayer. Really appreciate it, Miigwech. Um, and I'm really honored and happy to be here and thankful to all of you guys for being on here. And I, I hope you guys are all super excited and have your fun kits with you so that we can make some really, really amazing medicine today, um, no matter where you're from, Mashkiki or Pejuta. Um, so uh, I am Linda Black Elk, and I'm actually originally from the Catawba Nation, but I grew up on Standing Rock. And I'm coming to you right now from the lands of the Ocheti Shakomi um, and uh, the Mandan. And uh, I teach at United Tribes Technical College up here. So that's a tribal college, tribal university up here in Bismarck. And I'm just um, really happy to be teaching there. And uh, I teach food sovereignty and ethnobotany. And so um, basically, I, this is what I teach, what I'm going to show you guys today. This is what I do all the time with my students. And it's so fun because um, what we do is we just, we go outside. Well, when COVID isn't like a pandemic, we go outside <laughs> together. And um, we harvest, we identify plants. We harvest those plants, we bring them back into the classroom, we make amazing things out of them. Um, I teach my students how to store the plants, I teach them how to cook with them, all kinds of stuff. And I'm, I'm going to talk about a bunch of stuff, not just elderberries with you today, but um, we are going to spend some time making elderberry elixir. And so I hope you guys all have your kits so that we can get started because what we're going to do, let me just give you a little overview for a second. We're going to get our elderberry elixir started and then I'm going to talk to you about some other plants, okay? And while the elderberry is cooking and getting nice and infused into the water and becoming a really awesome medicine for you, um, well, I'll be talking about some other medicines as well, including the awesome teas. We're going to be making some teas today. Um, or in, at least talking about those teas today. Uh, all of this stuff right now is really amazing for what's happening in the world too. I don't know about, you know, whether you're from Mille Lacs or Red Lake or the cities, or if you're, you know, White Earth. Um, I don't know how much of a rise in COVID-19 cases you guys are seeing, but over here on Standing Rock, um, uh, Cheyenne River, up on the Fort Berthold Reservation, Mandan, Hidatsa, Arikara, over here in the Dakotas, we are seeing a huge spike in cases of COVID-19. And um, so all of these medicines are really gonna come in handy in case your family is um, struck with COVID-19. So um, I'll first, I'll go ahead and get started. And um, if you guys, if uh, Isabel and um, y'all, if you wanna just kind of keep an eye out for questions as we go that might be relevant right then, feel free to kind of interrupt me um, and say, oh, we have a question about that. Just because sometimes it's hard to wait to the end and people forget what they were gonna ask or it's not relevant anymore. Okay, awesome, thank you for that. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna start off with these cool kits, okay? These cool kits, and I say cool because I think they're really awesome. Um, uh, I think it was Sarah that found them. They're organic and they pr have everything you need pretty much to make really amazing elderberry elixir. Now that said, if all you have are elderberries, that is, is great. You know what I mean? If the only thing that you're able to get a hold of is some elderberries all by themselves, like here's, here's a bag of elderberries um, that I have, uh, dried elderberries. If this is all you can get a hold of, this is better than nothing because elderberries are incredibly antiviral. Okay. Um, they're medicinal in other ways too because they're anti inflammatory. So they reduce inflammation. So, like if you get sick and your lungs become really inflamed and, and you know, the, the breathing passages close up, um, elderberries are anti inflammatory. So they help to open those breathing passages back up. Okay. Um, but really what, what they are just, elderberries are just so amazing for is the fact that they are incredibly antiviral, okay? So um, 
we're going to uh, actually get started with that because, you know, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus, the name of the illness. Once you catch that virus, SARS-CoV-2, the name of the illness you have is COVID-19. Okay, so just to make that kind of clear. So if you hear scientists talking about, oh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, they're talking about um, the virus that causes COVID-19, the illness. Okay, so um, if, if you're afflicted with this virus, elderberries are a really wonderful way to help your body fight that virus, okay? And, and not just SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, um, any viral illness. So, you know, the common cold, influenza is a virus. So elderberry elixir is a great thing to have around during flu season um, because it's great uh, for fighting the various influenza viruses. Um, it's, it's just a really wonderful um, antiviral medicine, traditional medicine to keep around. And in case some of you didn't know, I'll, I'll show you a couple of pictures of elderberry bushes in a minute and what the flowers and leaves look like. But I just wanted to say that um, I, I have collected elderberries in the Twin Cities. I've collected elderberries in Mille Lacs. I've collected elderberries um, up on Red Lake. So they grow in traditional lands of the Dakota and the Ojibwe. Um, they're out there. Um, this is a traditional medicine. Now, there is not just elderberries in this kit, which makes it amazing. Um, we have cinnamon in here, and I'm just gonna open this up so you guys can go ahead and open yours up as well. If, if you're cooking along with me, if not, you can watch this video and do it later, or just you know try to um, memorize the instructions or whatever. Um, I mean, you know, the directions are on the kit, but I'm going to give you some tip, some other tips uh, and things that I do as well. But there's some gorgeous cinnamon sticks in here. Cinnamon is also very antiviral. Again, if all you have is cinnamon sitting around and, and you know, maybe you go to your cabinet um, and you don't have any elderberries. If you just have some ground cinnamon or cinnamon sticks and some honey, you have an amazing antiviral combination that's also great for coughs. Incidentally, you wanna hear something fantastic? Honey and cinnamon are wonderful for people who are diabetic and people who, um, I know that might surprise people because you're thinking, wait a minute, honey for diabetics? I'll explain that in a second. Um, but uh, something else you might not know, if you know someone who has um, um, arthritis, both honey and cinnamon are very anti-inflammatory as well. So they help to reduce inflammation. So um, if you know someone with arthritis and they can handle um, the sweetness of the honey, have them take a spoonful of ground cinnamon in honey every morning and it will help to reduce their arthritis inflammation. I mean, there's lots of medicines you can use, but hey, if that's what you have in your cabinet, it's fantastic. So not only are there elderberries in here, but there's amazing cinnamon sticks. And then you'll also see some other things in here. Let me kind of see if I can grab a, oh yeah, there we go. There's cloves. Remember when you make pumpkin pie and you put clove, ground clove in your pumpkin pie? Um, cloves are also very antiviral. Um, they taste pretty good too, but, uh, and they smell amazing. Um, but uh, they're one of the ingredients like in pumpkin pie spice and they're really antiviral. So you have all of these wonderful antiviral properties from the elderberries, from the cinnamon, from the clove, and from those the, the little sort of whitish yellow flecks that you see in there, that's ginger, ginger root. Here's what it looks like whole. This is actually fresh ginger root and there's some uh, dried ginger root in your kit. Okay, um, which is fantastic. So those are your three of the ingredients that I always put into my elderberry elixir. Now, I want you all to find your cute little brown envelope here. Okay, everyone have that? It's taped shut, open it up. and Get those cool star anise pods out of your little envelopes. This is star anise or star anise smell it smells kind of like black licorice which some people don't like i love that smell um uh there's a prescription drug a prescription medication 
called Tamiflu, okay? Um, and sometimes when people get really sick with a viral illness, in fact, some of the people who've been hospitalized with COVID-19 are given a drug called Tamiflu. One of the primary ingredients in Tamiflu, one of the primary components in Tamiflu is star anise, right? Because it's so incredibly antiviral. So think about that. You have all of these fantastic antiviral ingredients right in your hands. Um, if you don't have them in your hands, there you can you can order all of these, or most of them uh, you can purchase in the grocery store. Okay. So what we're gonna do is you're gonna take your saucepan, cook pot, whatever you have. You're gonna add all the star anise from the little brown envelope. Okay. And then you're just gonna pour your entire kit into there to waste the elderberries so try to get them all out of there okay so i have my star anise and my elderberry kit in this saucepan okay and if you follow the um, instructions on there it's super easy it's just three and a half cups of water okay now let's look at these ingredients just for a second so super simple um boil three and a half cups of water they want you to add the um the packet after it comes to a boil it it's there's no reason for that i'm not sure why they do that but um they have you cover with the lid and reduce um the heat to a simmer for 60 minutes i'm just gonna you can see my little hot plate right back here behind me i'm just gonna put this on my hot plate and turn it up and get it started. So that's gonna come to a boil, uh, hopefully soon. <laughs> um, who knows how long it'll take. If it, takes, if it starts taking too long or if that hot plate doesn't heat up well, I'll just go put it on the stove. You guys can go, uh, make sure to put your star anise in there and your packet and go put it on the stove. Um, and I'll give you just a couple of seconds to do that. Sing Jeopardy, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> so go put that on the stove. We'll set that stuff aside. And that's all we have to do for now. It's really simple. That's what's great about the kits. Now, if you didn't have the kit, you can find elderberry, um, at, you can find el dried elderberries at present moments in the city. Um, you can order them online. You can gather them, but they're not ready. Um, when I've gathered them in Minnesota, in Dakota and Ojibwe territories, I get them around like August, early August, sometimes late July they're ready, but not often. They're, they're just now flowering. So if you start driving around and you see, um, and you see some, uh, I'll show you what they look like in a second, some elderberry shrubs, you can kind of mark those spaces in your mind and think, oh, I have to go back to those shrubs in August to get the, the elderberries, the fresh elderberries. Um, but, but, you know, I, I really like that because I really want to encourage you all to develop relationships with plants. Do you know what I mean? Not just like go online and buy elderberry, but to actually know its name, know what it looks like, know where it grows. And then you can offer your tobacco to that plant yourself. And um, uh, I mean, and, and I offer tobacco even when I get plants from stores. You know what I mean? When I get stuff, you can still go outside and offer your tobacco and pray for that medicine. Um, but you know, when you harvest it yourself, you're developing a relationship with that plant and that's so nice. Um, but there's no way, you know, I do hundreds of these workshops a year. So I, even I buy elderberry, you know, there's no way I can harvest enough for, you know, 250 workshops a year. So e even I um, end up purchasing some of them. Uh, and, and I pray over them really hard, especially when I make the medicine. Um, but, you know, it's nice to know what they look like so that you can harvest them yourself. Now, just a note on elderberries in Minnesota. You guys have a lot of red elderberry. That's the, they look a lot like a, a regular elderberry bush, um, but the berries are red. Those are not the same. They do not have the same medicinal compounds, um, and they definitely don't taste the same. If you, if you have a second to actually try one of your black elderberries right now, you can take one of the elderberries from the kit or two of them and give them a try. They're great in trail mix. Um, I, I've eaten elderberry pie before. Um, I've had elderberry syrup. Um, one of my friends makes elderberry infused vinegar. 
and they're all really good. You can cook with elderberries, okay? So like if you wanted to, you know, make, um, if, if you make wojapi or like the berry pudding, you can make wojapi with, um, with elderberries. Really, really delicious and very good for you. And then you're having antiviral wojapi or antiviral elderberry pie, which is nice because <laughs> you're having medicinal and it's still delicious. Um, but elderberry elixir is delicious too. So, okay. So, you know, if you, if you don't have, if you don't have access to one of the kits, you can go out, you can get some elderberries, you can um, get your own ginger, okay? You can certainly get your own cinnamon and clove um, and star anise. Those are sold even, even in tiny little Mobridge, South Dakota, where I lived for a very long time, they sell those spices, okay? All right, so we have that cooking, and now I wanna talk to you guys about some of the teas and things like that. Um, I'm gonna screen share um, a PowerPoint with you guys, just so I can show you some pictures. So um, I hope everyone sees that. Do you guys all see the pictures of elderberries there, of the elderberry bushes? Awesome. So on your left, hopefully, you'll see a huge elderberry bush there. Um, and that's sort of what they'll look like. Um, there are ones that size in Minnesota easily. And right now, if you drive around, you'll see these large shrubs with these beautiful, lacy, white, disc-shaped flowers. Okay, so you can see there on the right, what a, a close up of the flower, um, and even a close up of the leaf. Now, if there is any doubt at all, okay, and you're like, okay, that doesn't look like a shrub, um, that doesn't look like a lacy flower, you know, um, the leaves don't look right, then don't, you know, don't take a chance and start eating it right then and there, or using it for medicine right then and there feel free to send me a picture of what you find and I can verify whether or not that's elderberry for you, okay? I have no problem doing that. I get hundreds of pictures a day from people um, asking me to identify plants. Uh, and it's better safe than sorry. Um, it's, it's hard to, to poison yourself with plants. It's, it's difficult. <laughs> um, you'd have to like eat a ton of them or something like that. But, um, you know, still, don't take a chance, okay? So um, this is what elderberry looks like, and they do grow um, in Minnesota. It's actually a slightly different species that grows in Minnesota, but it's still black elderberry, and they're still very useful and delicious. Thank you, I have an assistant who's stirring my elderberry elixir for me. <laughs> so that's nice. <laughs> um, so, so that's elderberry, and and um, let me let me say something for a second about elderberry elixir. Okay, so elderberry elixir is an antiviral sort of syrup, but it's not really called a syrup because it's kind of thin, right? It's not necessarily the the thickness of nice thick maple syrup, for example, right? Um, so it's an elixir. Plus, it contains you know it's it's not really a syrup that you put on pancakes, although you could. You could safely put elderberry elixir on pancakes if you wanted. It wouldn't hurt anything, but you know it's it's a bit thin for that. Um, and there's all of these other medicines and spices and things like that in it. Um, elderberry elixir is also not just a great antiviral. It's not just a great anti-inflammatory. It is wonderful for coughs. If you have a persistent cough, my sister Karen, she um, had this horrible cough for three months. And it was just persistent, day and night, a cough. She had gone on multiple rounds of antibiotics. She had tried everything from the doctor, okay? And I kept saying to her, try some elderberry elixir. Try some elderberry elixir. You have, you, it, you know, because I thought um, in diagnosing her, I thought, oh, she has some virus that she can't, just can't get rid of. Viruses can really hang around for a long time. I mean, how many of you have had a persistent cough that you just couldn't get rid of for weeks and weeks, right? I think we've all experienced that. So um, I gave her some elderberry elixir. She finally broke down and she was like, okay, you know, even though my doctor didn't tell me to take the elderberry elixir, I'll take some. <laughs> um, and I was really happy she took that step. 
Uh, and so um, she started taking the elderberry elixir and three days later, her cough was completely gone. And she, of course she was so mad at herself for living with that cough for three months when she could have just used some traditional medicine and gotten rid of it. Um, the thing, you know, I, I love Western medicine, don't get me wrong. I have um, lots of friends who are doctors and things like that. Um, but they don't know everything. And, and sometimes they're just not working together with our medicine and our, our people uh, to create something that's more whole, right? Um, and in fact, if, you, if you're a scientist like I am, you can actually look up a lot of the papers, the literature, the research on elderberries and elderberry elixir. And, and you'll see that even um, uh, Western scientists are using it to treat viral illnesses, okay? So, so elderberry is wonderful, not just for the antiviral, not just for the anti-inflammatory properties, but also for treating coughs. And here's, here's the thing. Some of you guys have heard me get on, I, Sarah, I bet you've heard me talk about um, over-the-counter cough syrup numerous times. <laughs> You're probably sick of it, but I, I have to make sure you all know. Uh, um, over-the-counter cough syrup, like Dimetap or Robitussin, their active ingredient is called dextromethorphan, okay? So sometimes in the store, you'll see those bottles of Robitussin um, or bottles of NyQuil or bottles of whatever, and they'll have, they'll have the letters DM after them, DM or DXM, and that stands for dextromethorphan, okay? That's the active ingredient that supposedly stops you from coughing, okay? The question you have to ask yourself is, why? How does that stop you from coughing, okay? The answer is not what most people think. The number one answer I get from my students is, oh, well, the cough medicine coats your throat. It soothes your throat and your lungs um, so that you don't have to cough. That's not true at all. What The reason dextromethorphan, the reason those over-the-counter cough medicines stop you from coughing is because they're actually a hallucinogen or, or what we call more specifically a disassociative that acts on your brain, a part of your brain, and convinces your brain that you don't have to cough. That's how they work. They are literally, look it up, <laughs> dextromethorphan is a hallucinogen and it acts on your brain. Here's the really scary part, okay? Long-term use of dextromethorphan can actually dampen your ability to feel emotion. You can't be as happy anymore. You can't be as sad anymore. You just don't feel. So if you see, like even sometimes you'll see, remember when we were kids and now they've taken um, dextromethorphan off the market for kids under six or something. But I remember seeing some of my friends um, whose parents gave them those cough medicines and they would just sit there like, and it's because they basically couldn't feel. Dextromethorphan, and you know, you guys have heard Robitussin and those, they're being used as street drugs now because they are hallucinogenic. Um, but that's the problem. Uh, the the long-term use of them and, and the overuse of them can actually dampen our ability, uh, reduce our ability to feel reduce our ability to feel emotion. So if you take nothing else from this whole webinar, please, please do not use um, over-the-counter cough medicine. Not only does elderberry work incredibly well but um, in, in treating cough, but it has raw honey, okay? And, and you can look up numerous studies that show that um, raw honey actually works just as well as over-the-counter cough syrup in controlling coughs. Raw honey, just plain raw honey, without the elderberries, without the ginger, whatever. Um, you can just use, if you don't have your elderberry elixir with you, you can just use raw honey and it can help to treat a cough um, better just as, and just as well as um, over-the-counter cough syrup, okay? Um, it's, I, I just always find that amazing. Like, why are people still using that when just plain raw honey works just as well? Um, but, you know, we're lucky today because here we are making our elderberry elixir, which not only has the honey, the raw honey in it, but it also has the antiviral. So 
uh, proper anti-inflammatory properties of the elderberry. So not only are you helping to control the cough so you can get some rest, but you're also getting the antiviral properties and you're, you're healing yourself. You're, you're treating yourself as well. So it's just fantastic um, stuff. So if you take nothing else away, please do not ever use that over-the-counter cough stuff again, especially not with kids, okay? It's terrible stuff. Um, when we're talking about elderberry elixir, uh, let, me just, let me just say that there are other things you can add to it besides the cinnamon, the clove, the ginger, and the star anise, okay? I have friends who add tons of, um, I know I have some sitting around here somewhere. Oh, here we go. Rose hips. Okay, these are the red berries off the rose bush. So check this out. Okay, are you looking at your screen? There's a picture of wild rose, okay, and the rose hips, the, the rose berries. Those berries off of the rose bush are super high in vitamin C and they help to prevent infection. Okay, so if you um, are concerned, uh, like maybe you're one of those people, whenever you catch a virus, it automatically eventually turns into pneumonia. Pneumonia, of course, is an infection of the lungs, okay? Um, and it can be caused by a bacteria or it can be caused by a virus. Um, large doses of vitamin C, natural vitamin C, like in the form of rose hips or wild roseberries, um, can actually help to boost your immune system and prevent... <laughs> my four-year-old, my five-year-old is just like, and elderberry. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the rose hips in the elderberry elixir can actually help to boost your immune system and prevent the infection, okay? So that's a nice thing to add to your, if you want to, you can absolutely add um, some of these rose hips to your, to your elderberry elixir. Um, you can also add, <laughs> come here, son, if you want to say hi. Oh, oh okay. Um, sorry, he just, come here. He just wants to say hi real quick. This is my... <laughs> Okay. All right. Go ahead, baby. Um, love you. Okay. The other thing is, is right now you have echinacea um, it, it tea. We're in, and I'll show you a picture of echinacea um, in a little bit. I'm, I have one on here. Oh, no, it's not next. But um, this echinacea root, um, I can't remember what it's called in Ojibwe. In Dakota, it's Ichafbehu. Okay. But uh, this echinacea is fantastic for boosting your immune system as well. And, and oftentimes, I'll actually make a tea with rose hips and, um, and uh, echinacea, because the two of these are wonderful for boosting your immune system and preventing illness, preventing infection. Even during flu season, I'll take this, just to keep myself from getting sick. But um, the echinacea, you can actually put this right into your elderberry elixir and some rose hips if you want, okay? Um, some other things, oh, I have friends who are adding cedar to their elderberry elixir. So, you know, I know cedar is a really important medicine for my Ojibwe friends who are on here, uh, my Anishinaabe friends, and my Dakota friends love um, cedar. You can actually add some cedar right to your elderberry elixir as it's cooking, okay? Um, other things you can add, oh, if you don't have any, any cedar, or maybe you live further out west like I do, because around here, um, flat cedar does not grow in the Dakotas, uh, unless people plant it in their yards, right? But we have tons and tons of juniper. You know those blue juniper berries? We actually, uh, for this webinar series uh, with, with NAC, the uh, Native American Community Clinic, we made um, a juniper cedar chest balm a few weeks ago. So those cute little, if you have any um, juniper berries left over, say, say that you had tons of juniper when you were making your chest balm, you could actually add your leftover juniper right to this medicine, to this elderberry elixir. And it'd be a fantastic, uh, great medicine addition to that, okay? Um, what else can you add? Cedar, oh, bear root. Um, OSHA, some people call it OSHA in English. That's a huge piece of bear root. Maybe you're more used to seeing the small chunks of bear root. Matro uh, trapejuta in um, Dakota and Lakota um, has that wonderful smell to it. But 
osha or bear root is wonderful for lung support so if you're someone who has asthma like i do if you're someone who's prone to a lot of lung infections um adding some ground osha ground bear root to your elderberry elixir is fantastic okay uh sometimes i can you know my friends make osha honey or bear root honey which is honey just raw honey that they grind up um bear root and they they put it in there you can just take a spoonful of that every day and it helps to um keep your lungs open helps to keep them healthy it's it's for, for people who work with plants we call them herbs for or herbs for lung support okay uh so they're they're really wonderful you know the other thing the other fantastic thing you can add to your elderberry elixir which i know all you guys out there in in minnesota and wisconsin um you love your chaga and i love chaga too add some powdered chaga to your elderberry elixir if you have some laying around it is wonderful chaga is great lung support and it's wonderful for your immune system, okay? Um, are there any questions right now as we're going along? Any? Hi, Linda. We have a lot of questions um, focusing on um, the amount. Okay. How much cedar, how much elderberries, um, what's the dosage of the elixir? Okay, all right. Um, so I can just deal with that like in, in, one, in one fell swoop. <laughs> so it's up to you. <laughs> no, I, I let me be more specific because I understand the anxiety of like, okay, how much of this do I add and how much of that do I add, which is why people like these kits so much, right? Because it's already pre-measured for you. You know, you just follow the ingredients. Um, let me just say, first of all, the reason I say it's up to you is, is because I firmly believe that. If you are someone who loves a lot of cedar and you drink cedar tea all the time and, and you know it's an important part of your day and your daily ritual, you might want to add more cedar than what I would add. Um, if you want to you know, make a half rose hip and half elderberry elixir, you totally could do that. Just if you, especially if you have like a bunch of rose bushes growing in your yard with huge, beautiful rose hips, you could add as many of those as you want. Um, if you don't even have any elderberries and you wanted to make a rose hip elixir in place of, you know, if, and you didn't have any elderberries, you could use the rose hips with the ginger and the star anise and the cinnamon and clove. Um, so, so what I'm saying is be creative, trust your body. You know, if you, if you drink, um, if you drink it and it has cedar in it and you don't like the way it makes you feel, don't put cedar in it next time, for example. Okay, but all of that said, um, if, if I were using this kit, okay, if I were using this kit and I wanted to add rose hips, I would add probably two tablespoons of rose hips to this, okay? So for every cup of elderberries that you have, for every cup of elderberries, you might wanna add about two tablespoons of rose hips, um, a tablespoon of cedar, just because cedar oil is pretty strong and it's flavored pretty strong. Do you guys drink cedar tea? It's, it's strong, right? Um, so, you know, just, just, you might want to think about that. So if I were gonna, you know, that was about a cup of, a full cup of rose hips, I'd add, I mean, I'm sorry, a full cup of elderberries in this kit. I'd add about two tablespoons of rose hips, one tablespoon of cedar. Um, I'd add probably two uh, tablespoons of the echinacea. Um, and, and I'd probably add about two tablespoons of the bear root too, although it's pretty strong. But I'm someone who loves a lot of bear root and I, I eat bear root honey by the spoonful. Um, if you don't like the taste of it so much, sorry, <laughs> I have plants on my face. Um, it tastes like celery kind of, bear root does. And if you don't like the taste of celery, if you don't like that really strong celery-like flavor, you might not want to add two tablespoons of bear root to your elderberry elixir. Just add one, okay? Um, so I, I hope that helps a little. Uh, when, when I'm I, I, on the paper that was sent with your kit, uh, there's, I put my own personal recipe for elderberry elixir, and so I hope that's helpful as well so that if you don't have access to the kit, you can use that instead, okay? Um, I, I also wanna say that 
uh, if you have, you know, you guys are over there in um, maple country. Um, this is some maple syrup that was given to me recently um, by a good friend of mine. It's amazing stuff. Um, if you have maple syrup and you don't have raw honey, you can actually use the same amount of maple syrup in your elderberry elixir. Maple syrup is, um, it helps to regulate blood sugar, it's high in potassium, and it's high in zinc, which is one of the, com the, the, the medicines that's being used to fight COVID-19. So, you know, maple syrup is, is a fantastic medicine in and of itself. I think we all on here, I don't have to convince you of that. I think you guys probably all know that. Um, so you can absolutely use maple syrup. Now, maple syrup does not treat cough as effectively as raw honey, okay? So if you wanted the medicinal properties of the maple syrup, maybe just add half and still add half the raw honey. Totally up to you, okay? Be creative with these recipes. You don't have to, you know, I even have friends, once they finish their elderberry elixir, they add a bunch of vinegar, like raw apple cider vinegar to it. It tastes terrible in my opinion, but they love that vinegar and they love the medicinal properties because vinegar really is good also for your immune system and your lungs. Um, another thing that a lot of my friends add, uh, this is birch syrup that was made by friends of mine. Uh, some of you probably um, have birch syrup and, and maybe um, you do your maple sugar bush and then you do your butch, uh, birch, <laughs> sorry, birch sugar bush after that. Um, if you have birch syrup, it is fantastic for lungs as well. So you can add some of that. What I'm saying is be creative, use what you have, um, and, and, you know, and have fun with it as well. Okay. Make your own family recipe. The recipe I sent you guys, that's our family recipe. When I was talking to my partner earlier today and I was like, um, what? help me think of like, you know, cool things that they could add to their elderberry elixir. And he was like, you always make it the same way. And, and that's true. And it's because it's our family recipe. But if I'm making it for other people, um, and there's, they say, oh, can you add some bear root in there for me? I totally do that. Okay. How, how's you guys, are, have you checked on your elderberry recently? Mine, uh, luckily I have someone checking on it for me because you don't want it to overflow or anything like that or boil over. Um, and you want it to reduce. That's why we're, we have it on a low simmer is because you want it to get kind of thicker and reduce down, okay? So that's what we're waiting for. Um, okay, so uh, I've talked a little bit about, well, a lot about elderberry elixir and all the awesome herbs and plants that you can add to that. Um, if you have any questions on those, let me know. Was there another question on, on that at all, Isabel? Okay, awesome. Let's get to our teas then, the tea that we're gonna make today. And um, I think that you guys, did, did, did we get three? I got, I got two echinacea, one burdock, and one wormwood. Is that what everybody got or did people also get rose hips? We, we didn't do rose hips this time, did we? Oh, we did. Okay, awesome. Well, I have tons of rose hips, so that's, that's great. So these, look at these awesome tea bags. And, and by the way, I just wanna say that um, Isabel <laughs> cut out all of these tiny little labels for you guys and taped them individually to every one of those tea bags. And that's amazing. Thank you, Isabel. <laughs> we really appreciate that. Otherwise, you guys would have no idea what's in there, right? So. Um, so thank you very much for that. But look, check out these awesome, I, I've been using these drawstring tea bags for many years now, and they're fantastic because you can actually fill them with whatever you want. Again, you can get creative. If you're someone who loves rose hips and cedar, why not make some rose hip cedar tea that you can give out for Christmas presents? Or if, if, you, know, if you want something that smells like Christmas, why not do some cinnamon and pine needle tea and give that out for Christmas gifts? Put them in a cute little box or something like that, you know, and hand those out as Christmas gifts. These, I want to say, are the large tea bags, right? If you compare them to like a bag of Lipton, it's probably triple the size of a bag of Lipton tea. 
So you can use these way more than once. In fact, for this bag of tea, I would probably use this four times, like for four cups of tea. Um, you know, it would get progressively a little weaker, but you could definitely make an amazing tea at least four times with this bag, okay? Um, now these are already in really awesome tea bags for you, but I really like uh, mixing some of these. So what I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna open up my tea bag here um, of the burdock and let me, oh, there's, there's a picture of bear root by the way. Sorry about that. I forgot that I had that in there. So in case you were wondering what bear root looked like up close, I can also send this PowerPoint um, to Isabel and maybe she can send it to participants or, or you know, you guys can take screenshots, you know, whatever. Bear root, this, this particular species that's on your screen right now that we were talking about earlier, that only grows in the mountains. And so when the Dakota, Lakota, and, and the Ojibwe um, would use this, they actually traded for it with people, you know, from out west. We had these really awesome trade networks for food and medicine. Um, and, and this was one of the plants we traded for. It's really great medicine. Okay, so, um, all right. So the first tea we're gonna talk about right now is burdock, okay? And if you open up your burdock tea bag and just take a couple of those little pieces of the burdock root, this is the root of that huge plant you see on your screen, okay? See those little pieces of root? In just in case some of you don't have any. Um, that plant you see on your screen is both food and medicine, okay? Now, incidentally, look at that picture on the right of those burdock flowers. I always love the story, you can Google this. The guy who invented Velcro did so, um, he, he modeled Velcro on the design of those uh, flowers, those seed pods that you see on the right side of your screen. So, you know, if you're ever watching Jeopardy and they, and they say, you know, this plant was uh, the inspiration for Velcro, you'll be able to say it's burdock um, <laughs> because that was the inspiration for Velcro. Um, so burdock is edible and medicinal. You can eat the thick flowering stalk. It tastes like a delicious potato. It's not bitter at all. That's the flowering stalk, okay? You can eat the leaves, but they're bitter, okay? Um, I have actually uh, had students take, the leaves can be huge. I mean like huge, huge, right? This big, you can, you can like find some of the leaves that are this big. Um, and I've had students use them kind of like banana leaves. They'll wrap fish in it and steam the fish, things like that. So they're nice for that. Um, I actually use the leaves in a salve for eczema and psoriasis. Burdock leaves and the burdock root, incidentally, are fantastic for um, skin irritation. So if you're someone who's afflicted with psoriasis and you want a really nice soothing skin salve, if you're someone who has bouts of eczema, maybe you have bad allergies, you know, allergies and eczema go, go together, um, and sometimes you just get those itchy patches um, of skin, Burdock salve, fantastic. Um, and you just follow the same uh, method that we did in our last workshop actually for making that salve, and it's the same thing. Um, burdock root, okay? Do you guys ever go into any of the Asian markets in the Twin Cities? Next time you do, keep your eyes open for burdock root. They'll sell long, you know, thick um, uh, 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 pieces of burdock root because they're used regularly in Asian cooking, in soups and stews and even salads, okay? They'll boil them or blanch them to remove some of the bitterness, and then they'll throw them into all kinds of nice brothy soups. Um, if you're making a, a, a wild rice dish and you want uh, to add a really nice element, a crunchy element, um, boiled burdock root that's thinly cut, it'll add a really nice bitter carbohydrate crunch to, to like a wild rice salad or a soup, um, really good stuff. And you're getting a lot of medicine from it. Burdock root is cleansing, okay? So I, I, I am talking like if you're someone who eats a lot of fish and you're worried about mercury, um, eat a lot of burdock root. 
okay? If you are someone who has liver issues, eat a lot of burdock root. If you're someone who may, may have blood poisoning, burdock root is your friend, okay? As a tea or as a food. You can boil it down and drink the tea as well for the medicine. Burdock root is, is just wonderful. Um, but burdock root is also, as I was saying, bitter, okay? So, so let's talk about COVID-19 for just a second, people who are getting sick with it. Um, COVID-19 is primarily affecting two of your bodily systems. It's affecting your lungs and your respiratory system, and it's affecting your uh, digestive and cleansing system. So like your, your liver and your kidneys, but also your intestines. In fact, people are having such digestive issues that it's actually causing their liver to shut down, okay? So how do we fight that? And why am I giving you the burdock? And why am I giving you, sorry, why am I giving you the burdock and why am I giving you the wormwood? Both of these are almost just crazy bitter. Don't be scared of that. The bitterness is the medicine, okay? And this is what's going to keep your digestive system, your liver and your kidneys healthy, okay? Especially if you happen to get sick um, with this SARS-CoV-2 virus and COVID-19, um, this is really gonna help uh, to keep you well. You can also, if, if you're having some digestive issues, you know, maybe, maybe you're someone who is just like a constant burger and fry eater and um, you, you know, Maybe you think green jello is a vegetable and you don't get enough um, uh, fiber and things like that. Burdock root tea and even the wormwood tea is going to be wonderful for you. Now, um, so that's, that's the burdock root. Such good stuff, food and medicine, great for skin, great for your digestive system, wonderful for your liver, a great blood cleanser, okay? Burdock root. All right. Um, Let's talk about, um, I'll talk about the echinacea in a second. Uh, let's see, so if I, yep, okay. Let me, yep, let's talk about the wormwood. I actually harvested wormwood in the cities. I've harvested wormwood um, uh, actually all over Minnesota. It's, it's considered an invasive plant. But here's something really um, interesting. In Madagascar, um, which is a huge island off the coast of Africa. Um, it's an island nation. In Madagascar, they claim to have found the cure. Now, I hate using that word. They claim to have found the cure for COVID-19. They claim to have found the plant that absolutely prevents you from catching, uh, getting sick with COVID-19. Not just getting sick, but also the cure. Right? So once you get sick, it can actually cure you. Um, that's what they're claiming. And it's this plant that they're talking about. They're using wormwood all over Madagascar. I was watching videos and all the kids in school have to take their um, wormwood elixir every morning. Um, and you can kind of look this up. And, and something that they were saying, which I actually think is true, is that if it were not a nation in Africa, um, who, who was talking about this cure and this prevention for COVID-19, everyone would be using it. They said if, if, if Europeans had discovered this uh, a month ago, everyone would be using it by now. Um, the, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's the cure for coronavirus. Um, I have not seen uh, good data on that. But um, I will tell you that our ancestors, all of us here, have used all kinds of these Artemisias, the type of sage. So you, you know the, um, what I do with my sage bundle here. Oh, okay. So, the, you know, the sage that we burn, right, uh, that we smudge with, this, this is actually Artemisia ludoviciana. Sorry to use those scientific names with you, but but look at the name of the wormwood on your screen. It's actually the, the sibling of the plant that we smudge with, okay? They're related. And um, you guys know a lot of people say drink sage tea when you get sick, right? Probably a bunch of you have drank sage tea many times when you've been sick, and that's because it is antiviral. But that 
wormwood, the one on your screen is very antiviral as well. Um, and so, uh, and it's also wonderful for your, your liver and your kidneys and your digestion because of those bitter properties. Um, when I was working in Guatemala, uh, working with migrant farmers, I drank the water. You should not drink the water, but I couldn't, you know, I had no choice. Um, and I drank the water and um, I got Giardia, which is a parasite um, that causes horrible digestive issues. And this is what the Indians gave me down there, the Mayans. They gave me wormwood and I um, took like 10 capsules of wormwood a day and I drank the tea. I've never had a flare up from the Giardia ever again. And it cured it within, I think it was six, maybe even closer to 10 days of, of taking that. So it's fantastic for digestive issues. Um, so if you want to, um, you can actually take some of your burdock and some of your wormwood and mix them together in a couple of these tea bags and make a fantastic um, digestive tea that's also great for liver support, okay? Um, now, if you're wondering how much, I usually do about um, a teaspoon of each one in these, in these small tea bags. So here, you can see the size difference. Here's the large tea bag that you have some of and here's the small one. I do about, uh, when I say a teaspoon, I mean an actual, like this is a soup spoon, sorry. But you know, a, a teaspoon um, uh, or uh, measured. So let me see here. So here's my wormwood, okay? And that's about a teaspoon uh, measured. So you can actually take some of your tea bags or you know, you don't have to use a tea bag. If you have a tea infuser, you know, those balls that some people use, you can put some of that in there the wormwood, and then you can take some of your burdock and, and also put that in there, okay? Um, but these are, these are large tea bags. And so, you know, why waste it? You know, why not just mix as much of it as you can together? Um, and you can increase, you know, if you're using about three tablespoons of the burdock, use about three tablespoons of the wormwood if you have it. I think, uh, does everyone, um, Isabel, is it uh, a full tablespoon of the wormwood that they have? Is that right? A full tablespoon, I think, yep. Yeah. So, so you, you, know, you can actually take um, all your burdock and all your wormwood and mix those together. It's not gonna be as strong for the wormwood, but that's okay. Um, you know, if, if we're using a teaspoon of each, it's, that's in, it per, in a coffee cup, that's gonna make a pretty strong tea. Um, <laughs> but you know, this, I could make a whole pitcher of burdock wormwood tea and it, it'd be amazing. It'd be great. Okay. Um, the other plants that you have are the echinacea, which I'm going to go back to right now. Oh, so, so let me just review here. Wormwood, antiviral, antimicrobial, meaning it fights bacteria and parasites and things like that. So antimicrobial, um, antiviral, and, um, you know, great uh, for digestion, okay? All right, now let's kind of just quickly go back to the um, echinacea. Quick here. question, Linda, we had, um, is wormwood the same as Russian sage? No, it's not. In fact, the Russian sage, if I remember correctly, that's related to the, um, it's related in the same family as cooking sage. Let me, let me look that up real quick. Um, because I know, Russian sage is used a lot in, um, you know, people use it in landscape planting and things like that. So it's kind of nice, yep, it's a salvia. So uh, Russian sage is actually related to the same stuff that you put in like your, your sausage stuffing and all that. Uh, so it does not have the same medicinal properties. Now Russian sage is medicinal, okay? And it is, is it's, it's bitter, so it's pretty good for digestion. Um, now think about like, uh, I, 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 I didn't grow up Christian, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I remember people telling me a lot about bitter herbs being important in the Bible. Um, and there's a reason for that, because bitter herbs are in amazing medicine. So, you know, uh, if you have access to Russian sage, say it's growing in the, you know, make sure they haven't been spraying a ton on it, you know, of like herbicides and pesticides and stuff. But, you know, you could totally use that as, as one of your bitter herbs. It just doesn't have the same level of anti, 
viral properties that the wormwood does? So great question. Okay. Um, all right. So let me let me just uh, the the echinacea, the purple cone flower. Um, this I have found all over Minnesota as well, but only rarely. It it gets rare as you head toward the eastern part of Minnesota. So if you're in the Twin Cities, you're probably going to see a ton of this growing in people's yards or in front of businesses because it's another popular landscape plant. Have you ever, if, have any of you guys um, ever chewed on a piece of echinacea root? Uh, over here in the West, we call it numb root or numb root because it makes your mouth numb. And if you want to have a little bit of fun, um, I won't do it because I'll start talking like this and I'll start salivating a lot. And I don't want that to happen while I'm trying to talk to you guys. But if you want to, like, if you have a sore throat or if you have a toothache or something, chew on some of this echinacea root right now. Just put some in your mouth and start chewing on it and you'll see it, it numbs your mouth for about 15 minutes. And you can, you can just swallow it. You can eat it too. It's not going to hurt you or anything. Echinacea is very safe. It's actually protected over here in the Dakotas um, because it's become such a popular herbal remedy that you can go into Walmart and buy echinacea capsules. Okay, it's, it's become a, a super popular herbal remedy. I prefer the wild stuff that grows out here um, because it's just super powerful. Sometimes that root is so powerfully medicinal that when you chew on it, you can actually feel your, your jaw vibrating <laughs> from the, the power of that medicine. It's so strong. Um, but it is an amazing medicine for boosting the immune system and keeping you healthy. And this is another one, you know, you can just, you can take um, your, your tea bags, your empty tea bags, and you can mix uh, the echinacea and the rose hips. Like I was saying earlier, these two, one of my most favorite teas. Uh, the echinacea kind of has a weird flavor and the rose hips make it taste better because rose hips taste like, kind of like a cranberry. Um, so that it makes them taste better, but it's also like the power of the vitamin C from the rose hips and the antiviral power of the echinacea. Wonderful as a tea, okay? Now, let me say something about dosage. You could drink half a gallon of echinacea and rose hip tea, and it would make you have to pee a lot. <laughs> but it's not going to hurt you um, because the medicine is so mild. We tend to be afraid of overdosing on plant medicine because overdosing on prescription medicine is such a real scary thing. Plant medicine is a lot more gentle for your system and it would take a lot of echinacea to get too much. Now that said, your body can get used to echinacea and if you take it for months and months and months, it won't work as well. So what I like to do is drink my echinacea tea for a week and then I'll take a week off. And then I'll go back to drinking it for a week and I'll take a week off, okay? If, if you're someone who has, especially if you have a really low immune system, it can be something that you put into regular rotation into your, into your uh, uh, medicine cabinet, okay? You just want to make sure that you drink it for a while or you take the capsules for a while and then you take a period of time off, okay? Um, so, you know, that's, it's another mixture you can make. Again, a teaspoon of the echinacea um, and, and even more of the rose hips. So if I did a teaspoon of echinacea, I might do a full tablespoon of rose hips um, as, as a mixture, and that makes a fantastic tea. Um, hey, Linda, can I yep. pipe in for just a second? Can I ask sure. everyone to mute their um, computers, laptops, cell phones? We're getting interference, so um, that would be great, just so that we can have Linda be the only one that we can hear. Otherwise, we get a lot of chatter and background. Sorry, I know I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> but I, I have a, so much that I want to share with you guys, <laughs> um, you know, especially during this time. So, um, okay. Checked on my elderberry elixir. It's looking super good. We're almost ready to finish it, okay? But let me, so, so when we're talking about tea, um, I do, it depends on, if, if I'm trying to prevent illness, I will drink like a cup of um, rose hip and echinacea tea per day. And then in the evening, I'll have a cup of the wormwood um, uh, burdock root tea, okay? I'll do that. Um, that's if I'm trying to prevent getting sick. 
if I'm already sick and I, I'm coughing and my lungs hurt and, you know, I, I just, you know, my, I'm sorry to say my pee is super yellow and, you know, uh, and, and I'm just not doing well, I will drink up to three cups of Echinacea Rose Hip Tea a day. And even that bitter burdock root and um, uh, bitter burdock root and wormwood tea, I'll drink up to three cups of that a day as well. And that's with a tablespoon of the plant mixture in a, in a good sized coffee cup. Um, if, if you do not like the taste of any of those, then th drink less, okay? Um, all right, I don't wanna get into tinctures because I don't have time, <laughs> but I had wanted to talk to you guys about tinctures as well because we use those here too. So um, before I move on, okay, so we've talked about those, all four of those teas, the burdock and the wormwood, the rosehip and the echinacea, okay? All wonderful, and I'm happy, are, is, there, is there a question? Maybe I have time for one question on the teas before we finish our elderberry elixir? Anybody? Or are we okay? Okay. We're All right. Okay right now. All right. Let's let's move on and finish our elderberry elixir, and I can answer some more questions later. Um, but I want to show you guys what I have here. So I've had my, uh, and, and hopefully you guys, some of you have had your elderberry elixir boiling and um, infusing and boiling down and all of that stuff simmering for a while. Um, what I have here is an empty clean bowl. And you can see I, I travel with my stuff when I do my workshops, so they get, they get pretty beat up. But I also have my colander. Um, I bought this one at a thrift store, I think for 50 cents a long time ago. Um, and I just put my, my colander in my bowl. And then you guys were all supplied with some beautiful cheesecloth, okay? If you don't have cheesecloth, you guys, this doesn't have to be fancy or complicated. Use an old t-shirt, okay? Use a tea towel that you have in your drawer. Use, um, you know, whatever you have laying around that, that's kind of thin um, so that it doesn't take all day. If you try a pair of blue jeans, it'll take six hours for your elderberry elixir to strain through there. Um, but you know, uh, I, I have used paper towels in a pinch <laughs> instead of um, instead of cheesecloth, just in a pinch, okay? So, um, could you grab that for me? Okay, so what we're gonna do, we have our little setup here to strain it. We're gonna take our elderberry elixir that's been cooking for a while and, there we go, and strain it through. Don't do this if you're wearing a white top because um, <laughs> that, that will never come out unless you just wanna try to dye the whole thing. Elderberries actually make a wonderful dye, purple, kind of a purplish dye. Um, oh my gosh, that smells amazing. <laughs> it actually smells so good. Um, so, so, you know, we've strained it out. Now, I wanna show you guys something. Watch closely, look at that. Do you guys see that dripping through there? There's a lot of medicine left in there. Don't miss that medicine. If you can, without burning yourself, Kind of squeeze that out. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll take this. Um, I need a wooden. Oh, there it is. I'll take this and I'll I'll kind of smash it up against the side of the colander to get all that beautiful medicine out of there. The other thing I have to tell you guys what a couple of my friends do. They will actually throw all of this into their ninja or their blender or their uh, what are those things called? Veg. I can't remember what they're called. Blender. <laughs> they'll throw it into a blender and they'll blend it all up. Cinnamon sticks, star anise, cloves, elderberries, the whole thing. And they'll add it back into their elixir. Now, when I've done that, I've tried it. My kids will not drink the elderberry elixir because it's just too strong with all those spices. Um, so, so that's why I strain mine out because my kids will drink it that way. Um, but yeah, get as much of that medicine out of there as you can, okay? Squeeze it without burning yourself if you can, all right? And once you're finished doing that, right there, you have a beautiful elderberry juice that's infused with all of these medicinal spices. So you basically have an infused elderberry juice. Um, dear, can you come get this? Okay, let me show you guys this, thank you. Um, so you have your beautiful elderberry juice right there, okay? 
it's cooked down, it's nice and dark, it's almost black. And all you have left to do, while it's still warm, not on the heat, you never want to boil your honey because it's medicinal too. And there's so much medicine in raw honey, you don't want to cook it out of there. There's nothing sadder to me than pasteurizing honey um, because pasteurized honey has all the medicine cooked out of it. Okay. Now that said, you don't want to, of course, give honey to, um, to children under one because of the uh, concerns about botulism, but that goes for pasteurized honey too. So, um, I actually had you take my spoon and I need it back. Sorry, dear. <laughs> so with the amount in here that I have now, um, let's see, do they even, oh, let the syrup cool before adding honey or sugar. Um, in here, how much, how much honey do they recommend you add in here? Um, let's start cool dosage. So, so I, um, oh, six ounces. Yeah. How big are these jars? 12 ounces. I was about to add the whole thing in there. If you guys only want to add half, you can, but I, I usually, I look at the amount I have and let's say if I have two cups of my infused elderberry juice, I usually add about a cup of honey to that, you know? So I add about half as much honey um, as juice as, that I have in there. So I'm actually gonna pour this. Um, I, I, so if you guys don't know, you, you know, maybe some of you already know this. I know Sarah knows this. I make food kits for elders right now um, because elders don't wanna go to the grocery store. So I make these traditional food kits for them. And so this elderberry elixir that NAC has donated that I'm making for you guys today are actually gonna go to some elders uh, who, uh, who need a good immune system boost. So that'll be really nice for them. So I'm just pouring my honey into my elderberry juice and I'm gently stirring it and I'm not on the heat. Again, do not cook your honey, okay? Um, just let it melt into there, all right? So I'm just gonna let that honey melt into there, okay? Just gently stirring it. Kind of, you can take a look at it every once in a while to see that it's melted into there, okay? Perfect. This is so good. I'm so glad that we did this together. <laughs> Cause I just think to me making medicine, especially like, I'm so sad that I can't be with you guys in person to make medicine because you know, it, there's something about us all putting like our prayers into this together and you know, thinking about it and putting that all into there. Uh, it, it just, it makes amazing. You know, it's mashkiki, it's pejuta, right? It, it changes the world. You can change the world with this stuff. And so um, now what I'm gonna do, they gave us these awesome jars, which I'm totally gonna use again, um, <laughs> by the way. But I'm, I'm gonna pour these into smaller jars later, but I just wanna show you guys. Wow. Yeah, you can tell I've done that before, huh? <laughs> this is fit absolutely perfectly into there. Um, uh, that's it. Put the lid on. Um, and you're done. It's that simple. Boil the elderberries and the spices until it reduces some. Add your honey and put it into a jar. That's all it is. Let me, let me say that again, because that's really all it is. Your elderberries and your spices, whatever you want to add, be creative. Be, you know, use your, come from the heart. Use the medicine that maybe your grandma told you about, right? Uh, be creative. Boil it down for, for, you know, 45 minutes or so. Um, and then add the honey and put it into a jar. It's that simple. If you are concerned, let, let, me, let me say just a word, because this is super important, okay? One time, uh, my partner and I made um, a huge jar of elderberry elixir. And uh, I just wasn't thinking, and I put it into the kitchen cabinet. Like two weeks later, we're somewhere in the house and we hear a huge explosion. And we actually thought that someone had shot off a shotgun in the house. And we were like, where did that come from? Where did that come from? I go into the kitchen and I start smelling elderberry elixir and I open up the cabinet and there's elderberry elixir and glass everywhere. If you leave this out on the counter, <laughs> it will ferment. 
and, and you don't want that to happen. Now, now if you, if you want to leave it on the counter, you could actually burp it once a day, you know, like loosen the lid and let some of the um, gases off once a day, but I much prefer leaving it in the fridge. Okay. So refrigerate your elderberry elixir. If you don't want to have to refrigerate it and you just want to leave it on the counter and you don't want it to ferment, you could add a couple tablespoons of lemon juice to this. Okay. Just add a couple tablespoons of lemon juice and you can put it, leave it on the counter and that will prevent it from fermenting. But just, you know, I prefer to leave it in the fridge. In the fridge, this will last until next year. Um, uh, it, you can freeze it as well. Um, if, if you want to make elderberry like popsicles or whatever for your, for your kids. I know some people who even turn this elixir into gummies. So they'll make elderberry gummies for kids, like little bears. Um, yeah. You, you know, oh, you can, you can cook with it too. Um, I have a friend who makes like a elderberry vinaigrette um, and she uses her elderberry elixir in a vinaigrette. And so she has like this medicinal salad dressing. Um, I'm trying to think of, of what else I want to say about that. I guess and that's we have, it. A, we have a question about burdock. Um, yeah. they, you mentioned it's good for liver problems, blood poisoning, and what else? Um, liver for, for blood and for skin, skin issues like eczema and psoriasis. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Sorry, I just wanted to kind of go back to that picture. There's your burdock. Yep. Skin issues, liver, um, blood cleansing, like if you have blood poisoning. Um, um, no, I'm, oh, sorry. Um, so for, do you have a, an amount that you put like a elderberry like ratio of elderberry to water i know this specific package is three and a half cups but you have a ratio for like, uh, elderberry by the yep. by the yeah i i do and what 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 ratio did i put in the recipe that i sent out to everybody isabel do you have that in front of you by any chance because because it depends on on the day sometimes i'm a one cup of elderberries to four cups of water girl um, sometimes I'm a one cup of elderberries to three cups of water girl, you know, uh, it just depends on the day and how, how strong I want to make it. Um, but you know, you can absolutely, I, I would say my standard is I usually do one cup of elderberries to four cups of water. Is that what I, what I did for that recipe? Great. Well, the package, um, the elderberry came in had three and a half cups. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's about the same. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right in the middle. <laughs> That's true. Um, so, so, you know, and, and if you want to make a stronger one, you can, but gosh, elderberries are getting hard to find. There was a period of time back in um, April when you could not find dried elderberries anywhere online. And it's because people have been snatching them up because they're such good medicine. And the thing is, is they're used all over the world. So like all over Europe, they use them as an antiviral. Um, so, so I prefer to make like a slightly weaker um, elderberry elixir or use less elderberries. And that's why I love to add all of those other amazing antiviral spices. Um, because even though I don't use quite as many elderberries, I still have all of the wonderful antiviral properties from those other plants as well. And, and like I said, if you don't have elderberries, um, I have used, I've made choke cherry elixir, choke cherries. Um, look up wild cherry bark for lung support. Choke cherries are fantastic for lungs. So make a choke cherry elixir if that's all you have. You know, maybe you have some frozen choke cherries in the freezer from last year. Make a choke cherry elixir if you don't have elderberries. Make a rosehip elixir. Use one third elderberry, one third choke cherry, and one third rose hips. You know, you, the, the nice thing about these traditional medicines, these sacred medicines of our ancestors, is that they're gentle on our systems, right? So you can be creative with them. And, and also think about that. Think about what I just said elderberry, choke cherry, rose hips. They're all food. <laughs> you know, I've eaten two cups of rose hips, dried rose hips in a sitting, um, uh, just because they're so tasty. You know, they won't hurt you. You guys know, you've probably drank tons of choke cherry juice and you've probably eaten elderberries before. Um, you know, these are foods too. So you know that they're safe and you're also, food is medicine. So you're also getting the nourishment from them that way too. Um, if you're thinking about dosages, I, I, I remember I, Isabel asked that earlier and I didn't answer that. How much elderberry elixir should you take per day? 
if you are trying to prevent illness. So if you don't want to get sick, you can do like a, a tablespoon every day. Um, if you are already sick, you could do five tablespoons in a day. Um, I will literally like, you know, set out these little cups, these little glasses for my kids every night with the elderberry elixir and, um, and there's some other elixirs that I put in there that, that we probably don't have time to talk about probably. But, um, <laughs> but you know, and, and they just drink that. Um, uh, and, and we also take a vitamin D supplement. Now, why do we take a vitamin D supplement? Because vitamin D, they're finding um, is very important in preventing and treating SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. Um, but, but also because uh, in the winter, we didn't get outside enough. And even now, you know, with us working and things like that and working from home, we still don't get outside enough. Uh, and, and I spend hours outside every day. Um, but I put on all my sunblock and stuff like that. So we take a vitamin D supplement. There's, there's really, you know, no other pills that I highly recommend. <laughs> um, but a vitamin D supplement is great too. So, um, yeah. So um, if you're trying to prevent illness, I do about a tablespoon if you are already sick, you can do anywhere from three to five tablespoons a day. Hey, Linda, should they let the elderberry mixture cool before putting it in the fridge or can they put it in there warm? Um, I, I like to let it cool um, sometimes, which is nice. It'll even seal for you if it's hot enough. Um, but I like to let it cool some before I put it in the fridge just so it doesn't affect the temperature of the fridge, not for any other reason. Great question. Any other questions I can answer about any of the stuff we've talked about today? Um, there's another question is what they can do with the rest of the elderberry. Okay, so um, like I said, sometimes I blend those up, okay? And I put all that pulp back into the elderberry elixir. But if you're gonna have your kids um, take some of it, you probably don't wanna do that. I'm telling you the grittiness of the raw, like the cinnamon stick and stuff, it's tough. Um, L, uh, L, uh, older people can usually handle that, but kids have a tough time with it. Well, some older people anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, you can eat them, you can um, blend them up and make like little, you know, dry it and make little capsules out of it. Um, you can make another, if you think there's still a bunch of medicine left in, in your elderberries, in your kit, go ahead, add another, like maybe a, a cup or two of water, boil that up and make some more elderberry elixir until you get all the medicine out of there. Um, once you get all the medicine out, you, you can just throw it away really because all that's left is fiber after that point. Okay. Any other questions? How, how, how much time do we have? Are we supposed to be done by now? Yes, till 2.30. Okay, that's kind of what I thought. So. <laughs> I, um, I, I, use a, I make tinctures as well. Um, and, and tinctures are basically plants that are soaked in um, some kind of liquid that's not water. So like um, you can take elderberries and soak them in apple cider vinegar. You can take elderberries and soak them in glycerates. And some people use alcohol, they'll make alcohol tinctures. But um, we don't like to make, you know, especially native people, we tend not to want to give out alcohol. Um, and so uh, you can make tinctures with vinegar or glycerates and you can use those too. But um, the, the reason I'm saying that is because some people uh, are like, oh my God, I have to drink six cups of tea every day <laughs> um, or, or three cups of tea every day even is, is a lot for some people. So you can make tinctures, um, but nothing, and, and, and this is the truth. This is uh, a thought I want to leave you with. Teas are traditional for all of our peoples. And um, nothing gets out more medicinal compounds than just plain water. So when people talk about alcohol tinctures, when they talk about you know making glycerates, or they talk about making vinegar um, uh, elixirs or, or things with vinegar, nothing gets more medicine out of plants than plain water. Tea works best. And if you want more medicine, just make a stronger tea, boil it for a longer time. Okay. All right. I, I have really enjoyed this and I hope you guys have too. 
if you have any questions, please, you know, email me or, or um, uh, you know, let me know. I, I'm on Facebook as well. Uh, I'm one of the only, I think I'm the only Linda Black Elk. I'm not quite sure, but uh, uh, so find me on Facebook and you can send me a message there if you have any questions. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed talking to you guys today and I'm sorry we can't interact more like this, but, um, uh, but yeah, I'm glad to have shared this with you guys. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Gwitch, everyone. Gwitch. Gwitch, Linda. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Just, thank you. Thank you very much.